Is this on? It's on. Okay. Michael, I think we're ready to get started. Yeah. Oh, cool. Hi, everyone. Oh. oh, I'm actually really afraid of public speaking, but then I just saw so many people that I really love. And then I got, it's going to be OK. No, it's good. It's going to be good. Um, so Andrew and Maddie, who curated Prelude this year, invited me to talk a little bit about my work to contextualize the bumps, which you guys are going to see tonight, um, which is such an honor and such a cool way to share performance work. So I'm going to attempt to do that for like 10 minutes, and then you guys get to see the piece. So I was thinking about um, how I think about theater, and I think a good way to summarize it is um, I was thinking about the Marina Abramovich idea that um, in theater, the blood is ketchup, and in performance, uh, the blood is real, right? That's her line. And um, I guess I'm interested in a kind of third option, um, <laughs> where you're thinking about the person who's covered in ketchup on stage, and you're wondering, like, is their skin really sticky, and who that person is, and who the person is who's going to wash their pants at the end of the night, mm. um, and how this elaborate structure, this like absurd structure that we create to create fiction, so often replicates um, structures in the world, which are equally fictional in a way. Um, so that's a kind of overview to my, to my work. Um, this, let's see. Um, this is a photo from my newest performance, which is a collaboration with visual artist Emily Mast. Um, and uh, it's called The Seed Eaters. And it premiered uh, two weeks ago in Austria um, at the Steirischer Herbst Festival. And basically what it is, it's, th it's this installation of um, theatrical sets that Emily built and uh, it's accompanied by scripts that I wrote, and each set can be activated by people, and by three people, any three people, especially not actors, and people who haven't rehearsed. And so the way that they choose to activate these stations really um, reveals something about them. Um, so this is a scene called Orgasm, where someone um, picks a tablet off the wall and performs a monologue about being an orgasm. So you can just imagine like 50 different kinds of people doing this. This is Ava. Um, I love this one, this one. Oh, so each station is um, about the idea of an end. Um, that's kind of what holds the piece together. And as a whole, it's a project that challenges the idea of order and hierarchy. So each station is about the end. This one is about um, dramatically unfurling a toilet paper roll, the end of a toilet paper roll. Um, and I love this photo because uh, this woman who performed this station is a retired ballet teacher. <laughs> and I think uh, this to me is like my work in a nutshell. It's creating a frame through which you see someone for who they are in a way that hopefully is beautiful and where you maybe don't even notice that happening. But I'm telling you about it now because this is called a studio visit, so you're in my studio. <laughs> um, yes, Monica. Um, yes. So I'm really happy to see some um, participants from this project here tonight. This is uh, Beth Griffith and Sandra Kingsbury are here. <laughs> this is a project called A Quarter Century. Um, which involves people over 65 and people under 25 uh, swapping language. <laughs> and um, so what happens if you see people over 65 performing scenes about being really insecure and being um, wondering if you're going to ever fall in love again, learning to live alone, um, having sexual fantasies about sitting on dicks on the subway. <laughs> 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 
And what happens, um, and actually, I think the future of this project is going to involve people in their 20s um, performing language from people of an older generation more. And so what happens, because I've discovered from working on this project um, how radical uh, people over 60 really are in, in ways that are often more radical than I think people my age. So what happens if you hear someone like me speaking the political language of someone in their 70s and it's actually like more impressive or you know more extreme and um, what does that do? And, and I'm really interested in work that kind of um, disorients you to the point where you just start to see someone I was trying to think of a good analogy for this, and um, my roommate and one of my oldest friends who's here who's a neuroscientist might know this, but I was thinking about those um, beakers that you like spin around and then you come up with like a, an essence or something. I, what are those devices called? Am I just a centrifuge? I feel like performance is a kind of emotional uh, centrifuge. That's what I'm trying to do. Um, So, <coughs> oh yes, we're not at the bumps yet. I knew there was more before this, but we can look at this image. So, yeah, so how, so how to do this in a way that, um, how to disorient you, how to open you in a way that doesn't feel like I'm telling you what to think. Um, but in a way that invites you to come to your own conclusions and in a way that you can enjoy. That's, I think, what I'm trying to do. And in 2013, I um, edited, this, edited this anthology, uh, which uh, was published by Jennifer Baumgardner upstairs of the Feminist Press. And it's an anthology of essays and art that imagines what a feminist utopia would look like. Some of you guys in this room helped me edit this project and make it what it is. And um, so in here there are essays that imagine what would a world, what would a classroom look like in a feminist utopia? Um, what would healthcare look like? Uh, what would art look like? And I really see my role in this as thinking about um, the structure, the structure, exposing the structure. Um, so for example, actually can you guys do me without the mic? Maybe it's better with the mic. Better with, okay. So for example, um, there, here you see a non-hierarchical table of contents. <laughs> and this connects a lot to the way that I think about performance as well. And here you see in the front um, a description that explains uh, how the contributors got paid and um, who designed the typeface in this book. And um, to me, this is important because, yeah, we should acknowledge that there is a typeface here that's designed by Claudia Kipp called Expansion. But I'm really interested in drawing attention to this to remind us that a typeface is something that someone designed, you know, and that literally everything we touch is uh, constructed by someone. Um, usually, in, this, in, in the case of typefaces, usually by like an Italian man. Um, and so, but yeah, to remember that because then we can remember that everything is a fiction, everything is a fabrication by a person and therefore can be reimagined. So with, this connects directly to the bumps, um, which is an act of structural imagination. Um, Yes, oh, I wanna say that, I also know that we, we know this intellectually, but I keep coming back to performance. I alter between writing and performance because in writing I think we can know this intellectually, but I think in performance it's a, it's a space to feel this and I go through the world, especially these past few weeks and I know that I've been really numbed, um, so I really appreciate all of the work this weekend because I remember, I remember feeling
So The Bumps is a play that is made for a cast of three pregnant actors at three different stages of pregnancy. It's meant to be performed for an extended period of time so that you watch one actor over the course of their pregnancy and so that um, over the course of their pregnancy they would play all three parts and then graduate from the production and then a new actor would enter the process. Um, and so in this way it creates a small ongoing economy for pregnant actors uh, and an ongoing community. Um, it also creates um, an ongoing way of inviting yeah, new people into the project so it's continually evolving. I'm continually saying goodbye to people too, that's the hardest part, but um, it's starting to feel like a real metaphor to me about like how to be in relationships with people in the sense of like, I know that I can't hold on to anyone for too long in the bumps, but how do you connect with someone knowing that, right? And that to me is what any human connection is. Um, it's always worth it to connect with someone even when you know it's not forever necessarily. So I wanna, um, I keep straying from my notes. Uh, yes, yes, I wanna take a moment um, to just acknowledge all of the artists that have been involved in this process because Dina and I, Dina Selenow, the director and co-creator of this piece, and I have been working on this for two years and so many amazing artists have um, passed through it. And um, so I wanna just take a moment to nod to uh, Jennifer Page, Emily Alprin, and Serena Kennedy, who are in our very first iteration. Um, and then so you see uh, Jennifer Page. Okay, so actually let me back up. So Jennifer is playing the three-month character. Serena is playing the five-month character. Emily is playing the seven-month character. Emily gives birth. We love Emily still, but she's not on the bumps anymore. <laughs> but then I want to write a play for Emily and her newborn, so that's part two. That has, oops. Okay, so then Jennifer is playing um, uh, five months, Serena's playing seven months, and then we have Sarah Garcia playing three months. And I love this photo, this was also in LA because um, we also see some members in the audience that have brought their little ones with them because even though we offered uh, free childcare for the audience, these uh, women chose to come and not use that service but they felt able to come because that was a part of the PR for it. So um, I, love, I love this image because of that. And then we did an iteration at the Skirball Center. Um, so this is uh, Christina Fernandez, Jean Sakia, and Diana Barone. Um, and in this iteration, our choreographer, Jenny Liu, was also pregnant, totally coincidentally, and our set designer had just had a baby. Um, so we were sort of this like f utopian pregnant collective. Um, that was a really special way to work. And then in this, and then the summer we had a version where we did a reading at Issue Project Room that was actually a fundraiser for Planned Parenthood, which is so cool. Um, this Broadway actress Jennifer Blood produced it, and that's Taifa Harris and Jessica Luck, who played one character, and now she's graduated to the second role and will be joining us tonight, which is so exciting. Um, so yeah, the next image is the one that you guys are about to see live. Get ready for that one. That's the best part of this whole show. So what do I want you to know before you see this? I want you to know that this play comes from a personal place for me in terms of what I wish that I could have seen, um, experiencing pregnancy at a young age myself. But it also just comes from being an American, from being a person with a body and seeing how the theater so often replicates the discrimination and erasure against women, against families, against people without security. Yeah, against anyone with a body with needs, pretty much. And so by reimagining the theater for a population that it ex excludes entirely, how does that improve the theater, but also um, how does that help us think about the theater as a metaphor for everything um, that can that can change. So with the bumps, specifically those questions behind the scenes, 
for me looked like how do you make a play um, how do you make a play where characters can um, where, where an actor can play multiple different parts where it's not about naturalism and a perfect match how do you make a play where it's um, natural for a character to sit a lot um, how do you make a play um, where uh, how do you approach costumes with a constantly changing body um, how can you structure a line item in the budget for childcare and stipends? Um, how do you make a culture of the rehearsal room? This is like a big question that Dina has had to work through and I'm so impressed with her. How do you make a culture of the rehearsal room where it's always appropriate to ask for a pee break or to have snacks and where that doesn't take away from something but is a part of it? And I think uh, that's been a really important part of our, of our process. <laughs> um, how do you build a set while you're holding a baby? What kind of set do you have? Um, and what about the audience? How do you care for the audience? And what if these needs, all of these needs, don't feel ancillary, but they feel like the starting point for the imagination? How do you see needs as material? Um, which I think we've seen a lot of this weekend at Prelude, and it's been pretty inspiring. So, um, yes. So, so just to uh, contextualize, tonight you're gonna see just the first act of this play. There are three acts. Um, the first act takes place in a waiting room in the 80s. The second act replays the first act, but from inside the perspective of the bellies of the first act. And that one is kind of outside of space and time, and um, that bleeds in throughout the whole play. So you'll see moments of that. And then the third act takes place today a generation later. Um, so I think that that's, that that's it. So thank you all so much for being here, um, for listening to me and for watching the bumps and I can't wait to talk with you guys about it after. Cool.
And then the guy just said go down the hall. Oh. Did you just bang me? <laughs> Hi, bang. So, so what? So popped. <laughs> Leah just said pregnant. Oh no, the casting call specified. It specified they were looking for, you know, classically pregnant. <laughs> yeah, uh, classically <laughs> pregnant. Classically pregnant. Oh. <laughs> At least that's what I think they want. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the guy saw me out here, so <laughs> they have me wasting my time. I'm seriously gonna whack someone with this. Yeah. <laughs> I just walked into the travel agency office. Everything here looks so similar. Did you know that on a Boeing 747, you can leave after dinner and get there in time for dinner in Mexico? <laughs> and what if you just stayed on that airplane? And what if you just kept going in that direction, you know, and had dinner and dinner and dinner? Wash and dry, all in one. Try Gregory's. Freeze, freeze, freeze. <laughs> Appliances for busy ladies. I'm a busy lady. Gregory's. <laughs> so I can be here for uh, you. Baby. Is it supposed to be a song? Uh, no, my husband and I were just making it up last night. Oh. And then we were joking that it would be fun to work in advertising together. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is, who's going to notice your situation? The casting call just said pregnant without <laughs> any specifications, actually, so <laughs> maybe she's fine. Just looks like a bloated person, but <laughs> she's okay. <laughs> Reminding myself that this this tiny fist inside me, <laughs> but no one else can see that, just me. Which reminds me, maybe other people are experiencing something that I can't see at all. And isn't that beautiful? I just think if they were looking for someone at that stage, they'd probably just hire a fat model. <laughs> mm. Maybe there aren't fat models. I, don't know. I just think they need something. 
something big, you know? Something you can't fake. I can think of a fat model. She's actually very beautiful. She's not even fat. <laughs> <laughs> I think, isn't this an exciting experience? Something we can only do at this moment, all six of us. <laughs> Our first Ooh. audition. Have you read about how sugar is the new smoking? <laughs> <laughs> Sugar and smoking, you'll see. <laughs> well, if this place had a peanut bowl, that'd be great, but here, do you want this? Mm. You don't want it? <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> the thought of eating anything is making me. <sighs> yeah, the beginning totally ruins food. But then it gets better. Then it just ruins your entire future. <laughs> <laughs> right, bananas. <laughs> what about bananas? Really bad for boys. <laughs>
or no, uh, my husband, he's doing research work. Right, right, that's what I meant. Right, right. Uh, are you from here? <coughs> Two generations, and we all love pizza. <laughs> Hardly a read it, though. Oh my god, how do you not? The lines. Oh, the lines. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it makes it even more delicious when you're starving, you know? Yes, maybe that's why I love it. Maybe I should wait for all of my food. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, you gotta eat a sandwich before you go. That's the only way. I should probably pick up a couple t-shirts from some of those spots before we move. Wow, where are you going? <coughs> Florida. Well, we're talking about it at least. No more driveways to shovel. Ugh. And the beach. Oh, I think the beaches here are so beautiful. The beaches here? The rocky beaches. Have you ever been to a real <laughs> beach? Like the beaches in Florida. No, but the fishiness. Doesn't that feel like the real ocean? It's like, it's like the breath of someone in the morning <coughs> and then realizing that's them. It's the specific, original breath of someone I love. <laughs> no. No, I want the white sand and the, the pools in the backyard that's got the lights and the jets. And we've got cup holders now for you beer. Oh, <laughs> beer. <laughs> I'm going to have the sand and the backyard and the pool. I'm rooting for you. you were in there? Consistency. <laughs> right. <laughs> so you're from around here? Oh, no, 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 no. We move from the city. My husband's trying a new business venture. So cheap here. <laughs> what is your husband? Soy. Soy? <coughs> He's in the soybean business. It's apparently going to be a <coughs> potato. In China, they already drink it for breakfast. <laughs> oh yeah, I heard some guys at the gym talking about that stuff. Hasn't taken off quite yet, but just a matter of time, and then we'll move. Or maybe I'll become infomercial mom and we can move back tomorrow. <laughs> right, baby? Oh, let's be good, baby. You're gonna be a star, a little starlet. <laughs> Very good. I don't know how anyone deals with parking in the city. <coughs> We're the people. 
Okay, I'm so sorry about the delay. Uh, we're ready now for the 315 slot. 315, we're ready for you now in room 34A. 34A. Here we go. We're gonna move right along to our 320 slot if we don't see you. Okay, shit, shit. <laughs> <laughs> wow. She looks so great. And so energetic for someone that far along, you know? I should ask her. I should ask her if she has any tips. Are you feeling, uh, are you? Oh, good, <laughs> because I don't have my towelettes today. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, um, let me give you my card in case you want to do Lady Fun do night or, or carpool in the future. Thank you, yes. Actually, actually, yes, yes, I would love that so much. It's, it's not a formal anything. But <laughs> no, wait, <right>, sorry. <laughs> it's just the idea of, of being rooted somewhere. Finally, so much is going to change for me. Cheryl. Cheryl. Mm -hmm. And, and this, the, this is the beginning, the community. <laughs> did, did they move it to another room? And our 320 slot, we are ready for you now. Fuck tarts. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, could you? <laughs> they didn't even let me talk. They just looked at me like little dick jerks when they saw me out here before. I was just saying how energetic you are. It's just common courtesy, the least you can fucking do is listen. Uh, you, you wouldn't mind not using language. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. You take two minutes of your fancy time. I, I can tell you're very And you listen to all in one, wash and dry. Please lower your voice. What if you don't always get what you want? Just give us one second. 
Um, I'll be up. Uh, I'll be back soon. Um, hopefully not too soon, but. Did they let you try after you? Who are these people? I mean, come on. You had that little song and everything.